Everybody got quiet all of a sudden. <laughs> Good evening. I, I'm Paul Revel, and I'm uh, here to welcome all of you to this Ask With Forum. We're delighted that you're joining us uh, for this conversation on the 2016 election. Um, I'd also like to welcome two visiting parties who are joining us live uh, via stream from New York City and Washington, D.C., hosted by HGSE uh, Alumni Relations and the Harvard uh, Alumni for Education Special Interest Group. I look forward to um, your participation and to receiving questions from those groups. Before I introduce my colleagues and frame the evening's discussion, I'd like to say a few words just about the Ask With forums, uh, especially for those of you who aren't familiar with them. Uh, these forums feature a wide range of topics and invite leaders in their fields to address the highest priority challenges in education. They help strengthen the intellectual life of the school through conversation, debate, and the exchange of ideas. They are also a way to open our doors and to welcome members of the greater Harvard community and the general public. Last year, nearly 20,000 people joined us on campus and online uh, for 14 forums. Upcoming uh, this semester, we have uh, another Ask With Forum next Tuesday, which will be a panel uh, assessing the DREAM Act and the impact uh, on undocumented students of not passing uh, this federal legislation. Um, and uh, Roberto Gonzalez, who's with us on the panel tonight, will be uh, uh, moderating that panel. On November 2nd, a panel discussing the significant role of minority teachers in the school system, student lives, and education policy, as well as the challenges in recruiting and retaining these leaders. That's on November 2nd. So let me now say a few words uh, to give some context to our discussion this evening. We're in the final stages of an unprecedented election circus. What else can be said about the, lamented, the lamentable spectacle uh, that has unfolded to our dismay each and every night, spiraling almost out of control in the past several weeks? But we're not here to commiserate on that topic. Rather, we know that this must be a room full of idealists coming together, unlike the candidates, for a serious discussion of education policy, and in particular, what this upcoming election tells us about where we are and where we're headed on improving our approach to educating all of our children to be successful in America and in the 21st century world. To the degree that issues have been discussed at all, education is seldom, if ever, mentioned. Why is that? How might it have been different? Does this even matter in light of the move to ESSA and a seemingly diminished federal role in education policy making? Should we, should we be watching down ballot races, for example, gubernatorial candidates probing into what they intend to do? On the other hand, maybe it's not the candidates, but the party platforms we should be analyzing for the future. Who knows? And what about Congress? Should we be paying attention to education issues and candidates for the U.S. House and Senate? Is it likely Congress will get active in the next few years on ed policy in light of finally having, at long last, reauthorized ESEA? In our field, there's widespread disagreement as to how to move forward in doing a better job of educating America's children. In the current discourse, our differences are more salient than our common ground. The climate is undeniably negative. We are divided over testing, charter schools, English language learners, even, even over more foundational topics like history and math. Our divisions have highlighted, have, have frightened away potential leaders and political supporters. The lack of attention and support could be perilous for our field. Equally perilous may be a lack of a cohesive, compelling vision for the future. Our inability as a field to come together with a clear, resonant voice as to what needs to be done and to, sec to secure a better future for our children. Educators, we as a field, have the responsibility to articulate a coherent vision to lead rather than react. So far, we're not doing that, and other leaders seem to be ignoring our field consequently. Therefore, tonight, we are asking these questions about what lies ahead, where do we go from here, who will lead? Where will they go? How do we shape effective education strategy in our complex intergovernmental system where federal, state, and local levels of government, to say nothing of the professional field and the consumers, families, are often proceeding in very different directions based on their widely differing points of view? To tackle these and other questions, we have a distinguished faculty panel this evening. Let me briefly introduce each one of them to you. Professor of Education and Economics, Dave Deming, uh, is also a faculty research fellow at the National Bureau of Economic Research. 
Recently, he was named a William T. Grant Scholar for his proposed project, The Long-Run Influence of School Accountability, Impacts, Mechanisms, and Policy Implications. Deming's current research includes understanding the rise of for-profit post-secondary education and the consequences for student outcomes and the policy implications of expanding access to early childhood education. Um, Assistant Professor of Education, Roberto G. Gonzalez. His research focuses on the factors that promote and impede the educational progress of immigrant and Latino students. His national undaca, uh, undocumented uh, research project has surveyed nearly 2,700 undocumented young adults and has carried out 500 in-depth interviews on their experiences following President Obama's Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals program. Since 2002, Gonzalez has carried out what is arguably the most comprehensive study of undocumented Im immigrants in the United States. His book, Lives in Limbo, Undocumented and Coming of Age in America, is based on an in-depth study that followed 150 undocumented young adults in Los Angeles for 12 years. Gonzalez will be moderating, as I mentioned, next week's Asquith on the DREAM Act. Professor of Education Mira Levinson is a normative political philosopher who writes about civic education, multiculturalism, youth empowerment, and educational ethics. Her most recent books include No Citizen Left Behind and Dilemmas, Dilemmas of Educational Ethics. No Citizen shows how schools can help tackle a civic empowerment gap that is as, wa as shameful and anti-democratic as the academic achievement gap targeted by No Child Left Behind. Levinson's newest project is on justice in schools, where she combines philosophical analysis and school-based case studies to illuminate the complex dimensions of evaluating, achieving, and teaching justice in schools. Associate Professor of Education Martin West is also Deputy Director of the Harvard Kennedy School's Program on Education Policy and Governance, Executive Educa Editor of Education Next, a journal of opinion and research on education policy, and a faculty research fellow at the National Bureau of Economic Research. His current projects include studies of public opinion on education policy, the effects of charter school attendance data, use in, uh, excuse me, the effects of charter school attendance, data use in schools, and the influence of relative pay on teacher quality. Wes is the author or editor of four books, including No Child Left Behind, question mark, the Politics and Practice of School Accountability, and most recently, From Schoolhouse to Courthouse, The Judiciary's Role in American Education. Our format will be as follows. I'm going to raise a set of questions for the panelists to address over the course of the next uh, three quarters of an hour or so. And they then we will turn to you, our audience, for questions. And I do mean questions. Um, and, uh, and we'll receive them both here in the hall and online. So with that, I'm going to take a seat, and we're going to get started. I'm going to this way. So my first question um, to members of the panel um, has to do really with the absence of conversation about education policy in the campaign. Setting aside the circus atmosphere of current events in the presidential campaign, why did the candidates seem to have so much trouble talking about education in the primaries and in the early and current stages of the general election campaign. Marty, you want to kick us off with that? Sure. Well, I mean, the first thing I'd say is I'm not sure how surprised we should be that they're not talking a lot about education. Education being a central issue in national level politics in the U.S. is the exception rather than the rule. I can really think of only one election in our lifetimes when that was the case in 2000. Um, a second reason may be that and one reason why it may not be a major issue in national politics is that um, people in the U.S. tend to think their own schools are doing okay. If you look at the grades that they assign them, they assign the nation's schools very low grades, so they think there's a problem, but to the extent that they think there's a problem, they think it's someone else's problem and not theirs. And the third, and, and I think the most important reason, especially when it comes to your question about the primaries, though, is that education policy debates are fraught within both of the two parties. So within the Democratic Party, you have a substantial number who favor a more muscular role in federal accountability. Um, they uh, generally have strong ties to the civil rights community. You also have a substantial contingent who's strong ties to the teachers unions who are very concerned about that. So you see that dynamic play out when you, I guess we know from 
Russian hackers now that uh, <laughs> that uh, the Clinton campaign was very worried about her support for the Common Core, that the issue was toxic, that they didn't want to be talking about it. That's a sign that they feel like that's going to divide you know, important constituencies in their party. The Republicans are each, equally divided. You have movement conservatives who want to eliminate the Department of Education. You have business conservatives and moderates who favor you know, uh, federal efforts to promote accountability, to promote choice. So I just think it's not an uncomplicated issue for the candidates to talk about, uh, especially when it involves the federal role. Yeah, I, I take your point about the history, although I, sometimes in the, in the national campaigns we hear a lot of talk about education at the federal level, but no intention later on to, to sort of follow through and implement people acting as though the president plays a major role when, when in fact he may or may not. But I wonder, to your point about the divisions within the parties, then how does that affect what they're actually talking about? In other words, um, are, are they steering clear of the issues on which there's significant division within the American public? and then only focusing in on, let's say, higher education debt or early childhood education uh, or, or whatever the topic might be because those are safe topics? Or do you see some other rationale for what, what does get mentioned when it, when it does get mentioned? Well, I do think, so to the, I, I have to admit, I answered my question from the perspective of K-12 education, which is where I spend most of my time uh, working. To the extent that you've heard the candidates talk about education, it has been early childhood, though with more of an emphasis on child care costs than on early childhood education per se, and on higher education, again, with an intense focus on the issue of cost. And so that, as a political scientist, I would say is not at all surprising because those are pocketbook issues, right? Uh, K-12 education, spending on that affects people very indirectly through property taxes, but people are very concerned in experiencing the costs of early childhood education, of child care and higher education very directly. So it's not no surprise that that would be where candidates feel pressure to uh, have solutions. So, I mean, Marty, I think your, your point about tension in the party, I think you can really see that in the Democratic Party in the primary versus the general. You've got um, Bernie Sanders talking about free college, Hillary Clinton saying affordable college and sort of alighting the difference between the two and, make, and sort of, and then as soon as the primary was over, she faced so much pressure from uh, the left wing of the Democratic Party to make, to make, to sort of create a plan that sounds like free college, that looks like free college and be as um, somewhat obtuse about how it's gonna get paid for and how it's gonna happen. So I, I think that's, that's absolutely right. Um, what, are, what are some of the other divisions but, that have created the silence? Well, I don't know, but on, on, on that one, that was a division over sort of tactics and just how expansive the effort to control college costs or make college more affordable would be, wouldn't you say? Not really a, a fundamental difference in philosophy. I, I, well, I don't want to put, I don't want to, it's hard to know what the Clinton campaign's philosophy, true philosophy yeah. is on this and separate it from trying to get elected right now. Mm -hmm. um, but, but I do think that part of it is, and I think some of this was in the, was in the I haven't been following uh, the, the WikiLeaks as much as you have, I guess. No, but, I, I, but, <laughs> but I, think, I, think part, I think part of this was in there, which is discussions about how to play the politics yeah. of this. And I, I do think, you know, if you asked, if you, if you gave Hillary Clinton truth serum, um, she would say something like, you know, this free college plan is not workable because it's too expensive, which reflects a priority, you know, a judgment about priorities. You know, because of course the federal government can borrow enough money to do almost anything if it wants to. The question is like, we don't think it's, you know, I, I would guess that she doesn't find that to be as high of a priority. Of course you want college to be cheaper and be affordable, but you know, given the trade off between that and other things and what we can accomplish, I would, I would bet against her making that a signature part of her, you know, first hundred days or whatever. What are some of the other divisions within either of the parties that cause them to be tongue-tied? Hmm. I mean, I, I think I already mentioned the key ones. One is just whether we should have a federal role at all is a, a big issue yes, for the Republicans. Right. Um, and I think the extent uh, to which we should emphasize school choice. So one of the... Uh, uh, interesting factoids about if you study public opinion on the issue of school choice, there's no issue, private school choice in particular, that divides Republicans and Democrats more at, among elected officials than the issue of private school choice. Republicans love to talk about it, Democrats don't. In the electorate, the opinions are ex actually reversed. So Democrats are more supportive of private school choice than are Republicans. And so that's, I think, because Republicans tend to be more satisfied with the public schools that they have access mm -hmm. to. Uh, less interested in alternatives. And so that's one reason why, even though there is this sort of among elected officials sort of consensus on this issue, it's not one that they run on regularly. 
Well, and then you have, you have tremendous fractious debate on an aspect of choice, charter schools, for mm -hmm. example, that's uh, proved very divisive in states like this and, and other places around the country. You've got the Common Core, which you alluded to, which yeah. has to do with the federal role. Um, you've got uh, a whole host of uh, controversies in terms of how far schools should go in the social and emotional domain, for example, uh, within the Republican Party to what constitutes, in the view of some people, invading family prerogatives mm -hmm. and in other people's views. So th and there seem to be a number of issues that where it's become sort of treacherous for political leaders to step out and say they support this, that, or the other thing because they're going to alienate a substantial constituency, so instead they step aside. So I guess I'd use that as a prelude to asking, what should they be talking about? Mary, in your view, what, what, what ought people to be, uh, if, you, if you could script some of these candidates, what would you have them say? Uh, <laughs> I'm really glad that I'm not on a uh, working for the campaign. Say, right. <laughs> <laughs> Most of what's being said right now, I would have them not say. Um, but uh, that's a little too late. Um, so I, I want to get back, though, for a second to your statement about it's becoming too treacherous. I, I, I think that Marty's point that it's actually unusual for there to be sort of nationwide policy level conversation about education during a, an election season when people's political futures are on the line and that education is more of a rarity is important precisely because it's, I'm not sure that this is, say, more treacherous of a time than it's been in the past either, right? I think education is always fairly treacherous and interestingly unstable in terms of what the alliances are. So it's, it seems especially unstable these days because, uh, I mean, say, uh, Marty, you classify the civil rights co community on one side of the Democratic docket and mm -hmm. um, say, you know, advocates of the teachers unions on the other side. But of course, there's also a tremendous split within the civil rights Absolutely. community, right? Um, uh, about many of these questions. Uh, and so I think, you know, insofar as education is in many ways about how we envision our future and what, what we see as uh, the, how we would describe the society we want to be and the extent to which we are willing to put on the backs of our own children or other people's children the weight of of shifting from the society that we are to the society, the more ideal society that we picture ourselves as, I think education is always extremely contentious and therefore is always treacherous ground. So to go back then to your question about, so what would, you know, if I were whispering, say, um, in Hillary Clinton's ear, um, I would not do that with Donald Trump, I have to say, for a variety <laughs> of reasons. Um, but uh, it's not really not an image that I had wanted to come to mind. Uh, so, <laughs> um, so if I were talking education policy to uh, uh, Secretary Clinton, um, you know, I have specific views about issues of choice, issues of high stakes assessment, et cetera. I don't think I'd be whispering those things to her for precisely the reasons that Marty talked about, right? I don't think it would actually be a good idea for her to talk about those things on the campaign trail. I think what I would be saying to her, and it may, I was just talking with a student about this in the in office hours about an hour ago, and so it may be that this would also be totally off topic, but is to say, let's be explicit about the fact that these are moral claims that we're making and that these are, uh, and that we're having ethical arguments with one another, in fact, about the kind of society that we want to be and the kind of values we want to realize. Like, do we want to realize the values of liberty and individual choice? Or are we trying to realize the values of equity and equality and, say, redistribution? Do those have to be in, in conflict? To what extent can we construct policies that actually bring those into some kind of consonance? And so one of the things that I am hoping, in fact, to get on her docket, um, I mentioned this to a few minutes ago, is I would really like, I've been thinking uh, about the ways in which we have a presidential commission on bioethics that addresses uh, the ethical issues around has uh, over time it, it addressed abortion uh, you know stem cell research euthanasia um, uh, CRISPR all sorts of mm -hmm. stuff right 
I would actually like us to have a presidential commission of educational ethics that will help us address the ethical issues around the federal role in education. How much, uh, you know, how much power should individuals have, individual families have to direct their uh, their children's education? How much role should the state have? How do we think about issues of equity, uh, collective aims, civic aims, et cetera? So I I would propose that to her. I don't know that that would be, you know, should she spend time on that while she's trying to, say, win over votes in Wisconsin or Pennsylvania? Probably not. But I would love for her to have that on, you know, on her agenda come, say, February 2017. Right, let's get a, another couple of contributions yeah, to the script yeah, I here. Yeah, I want to draw maybe a, a different circle and, then, and try to connect. Um, and that is there's, there's been a whole lot of talk about immigration, uh, this debate. It's a, you know, this is one of the more kind of inflammatory um, uh, parts of this, of this campaign. Um, Trump began his, his campaign with, with really inflammatory remarks about immigrants, uh, Mexican immigrants in particular. Um, and, and Clinton has a, um, some really kind of vague, kind of broad bro brush stroke um, points about immigration. But there's very little talk about the, I think, at the intersection of immigration and edu education. Um, and, that it, and that's interesting, I think, considering um, immigrant origin kids are, uh, they make up the, the, the largest growing segment, the fastest growing segment of, of school ch children in the United States. Um, that this population, uh, immigrant kids and children of immigrants, uh, in the last 20 years has grown 51%. Uh, about a quarter of all K through 12 kids have, have one, at least one immigrant parent. Um, and about five million kids in the United States uh, have at least one undocumented parent. Um, School districts are, are across the country are, are contending with uh, demographic change that they're having a hard time keeping pace with. Um, and once predominantly white schools are now much more diverse, uh, and many urban school districts are now uh, de facto segregated. Um, and meanwhile, staffing levels have not kept up with these demographic changes. Um, and. Um, and schools have really struggled to, to, to meet kids' needs. Um, and so while we're dealing with uh, a real demographic change, which I think, um, uh, to Mira's point about kind of philosophically what is education about, as we grapple, and I think that, that Donald Trump has been, I think this has been really front and center, who are we, this question of who are we as a nation, uh, this question about what do we do uh, with, with our immigrant students and growing uh, diverse communities, I think, uh, is a really critical question moving forward. Um, I was in Chicago um, last week and I asked, I'm doing focus groups with young people, uh, and so I asked them this, this question, uh, really generally, what, what education issues uh, should the candidates be discussing? Um, and here's a list. Uh, um, about 10 issues, um, quality early ed childhood ed education, um, equitable school finance, um, arts and other extracurriculars uh, that have been slashed from many schools, uh, diversity within the curriculum um, at all levels, um, ending the school to prison pipeline, um, high quality teachers, local accountability, uh, reducing class size, uh, school desegregation, uh, and school safety. Um, so these are a wide range of issues, but uh, that are really at the, really on the hearts and minds of a lot of our uh, of our nation's youth, <coughs> particularly young people of color. Any of them running for office? Yeah. <laughs> Let's see. Marty, what would, what would you add to the list of what should be talked about? Well, I, I mean, <coughs> uh, so I guess I would start with rather than with specific issues, with their vision for the federal role in education, because that's the transition that I think a lot of people struggle with, people who have experience at the state and local level and then come into office, and the question is, you now have, a, uh, you're in charge of a, a, government, a set of government agencies with a very different set of strengths and weaknesses, capacity and constraints than uh, was the case previously. 
Um, and so that's certainly the case for governors, but I also think it's just uh, something that candidates with the backgrounds that these two need to wrestle with. So I'd want to hear what their vision is for the federal role. How can it be most effective in addressing the types of specific issues that Roberto raised? I think um, related to that, you know, I'd love to hear Donald Trump uh, actually talk more about some of the things he's talked about. For example, he says he wants to eliminate the Common Core. Uh, he also says he's for state control over education. Well, at this point, <laughs> the states, 43 or so of them, are using the Common Core. The federal government is not involved at all. So does he mean that he wants to step in and keep them from using it? I, I'd want to hear more about that as a lens to try and understand what he's actually saying and where, what he would be likely to do. Um, when I asked him, he actually, I heard him on air say, of the three, mo he was asked, what are the three most important things the federal government can do, and number two was education. So again, I'd, I'd like to get some clarity on that. Uh, but I'd also like to get some clarity on Hillary Clinton's proposal. As Dave mentions, that at some point there will be a time to set priorities. So she has a very ambitious set of statements on her website about early childhood mm -hmm. education. She hasn't been talking about it much, but universal access to high quality preschool for four year olds. Well, what exactly does that mean? Is that working through the states? Is that working through private providers? What do you do with the 15 or so billion dollars we're already spending on uh, early childhood education from the federal level? Um, and how are you gonna oversee quality from Washington? I wanna know the answer to those questions and how important that is to her relative to the affordable college proposal. So um, I think there's more that they could be saying about what they have said. Okay. I mean, I, th I think one thing that makes these discussions difficult for the candidates is that, you know, Marty brought up the, the, what the federal government can actually do. I mean, the federal government actually just has mostly the power of the purse in the situation, which is to make it really, make the incentives really strong for states give out matching grants so that, you know, for every, you know, five, four dollars of federal money that goes in, you know, for basically state, they can say to states, we'll give you a lot of matching money on top of whatever investment you make, either in early yeah. education or higher education. This, you know, this famously didn't work out that, hasn't worked out all that smoothly in the case of Obamacare. There were very favorable incentives for state Medicaid block grants, basically, and some governors in a very high, high profile way rejecting federal money for political reasons or, or for whatever reasons because of Obama. So like, this is a very difficult thing for the federal government to work out in any case, especially with a political hot button issue. Um, I think, you know, so for my, t how I would answer this, you know, I'm a sort of policy nerd, and so I, I, I would think about this in a more detail-oriented way. I would say, what's something that um, candidates can do concretely um, once they get into office, some sort of free lunch type technical fixes that would make things better related to this federal role? And one is, if you look at the way, so one reason why, so may, many of you may know this, that um, the state role, so higher education is primarily funded um, at the state level on what I'd call the supply side. So basically legislative appropriations, money given directly to public institutions in a state. At the federal level, money is primarily given on the demand side through the programs like the Pell Grant, which is basically a voucher. Okay, so this is a vouchers are tend to be popular uh, on the other side of the aisle when it comes to K-12, but the Pell Grant is a voucher for higher education. It's given out by the federal government. You can take it to the institution of your choice. And so that tends to be a price subsidy, whereas the subsidy on the, on, uh, at the state level is on the spending side. Uh, and so what, what's happened over time is that states have divested their, at, at a pretty alarming rate, are investing less in higher education. Um, essentially what's happened is they're spending about the same per capita, but many more people are going to college 20 years, 20, than they were 20 years ago, and so the funding hasn't increased per student, it's about stayed the same per capita, and so there's kind of less, there's more students you know, chasing the same pot of money essentially. And one reason why that's happened, not the only reason, but one reason why that hap that's happened is that um, because of the way the Pell Grant works, it actually provides states a disincentive to invest in higher education because if they raise their tuition, which is, which is one way, in other words, like if the state cuts a budget, you can, an institution can raise their tuition to compensate for the shortfall. If they raise their tuition, they know that the Pell Grant money is gonna step in and absorb some of that increase. And so there's actually a disincentive to invest in higher education at the state level. That's exactly the opposite of Medicaid, which is, which is where there's a matching grant structure. So for every dollar the states put in, they get some more back from the federal government. And so what you've seen over time is essentially, at, if you look at the trend line, you know, how state budgets and higher ed have gone, they've gone down like this, and Medicaid has gone up one for one. So what's happened over the last 20 years, and, and I don't wanna say all of it's due to this technical issue, but I think a lot of it is. So one thing I'm working on is how to, how to basically fix the system so that we don't give a disincentive to, to states to invest in higher education. 
Can I chime in for a second? So you said that the federal government's power is primarily the power of the purse. Um, and I think that there are a couple of other powers that the federal government has, too. Um, and also, you know, it's a very limited purse, right, in, in that federal spending accounts for, what, about 9% of overall education spending, right? Much more in higher ed. Right, right, much yeah. more, right, much, in K-12, yeah. right, much yeah. more in higher ed. Um, but so in K-12, right, it doesn't even have much of the power of the purse except for sort of symbolic amounts of money, which interestingly, like, will in fact drive incredible changes in mm -hmm. state-level policy, but a little oddly, because the amount of money actually you wouldn't think would They're do They're big it. enough to be consequential, but... Uh, but not actually, small. right, yes. Yeah. Um, but I, do, but I do think that there is a role for the federal government, in fact, in symbolic um, language and what they choose to talk about, right? And so it is, inter I mean, one of the things that was interesting in Roberto's list when he started talking, and I thought, I didn't mention integration, right? I, I, I do, I mean, partly because I said, well, I'm not going to take a stand on specific issues, but say, you know, we have a large national set of conversations around uh, things like uh, human capital and, say, teacher, you know, quality, right? And we have a huge conversation around both standardized curriculum and standardized assessment and the relationship between those and to what extent assessments should be high stakes or low stakes and for whom, for students or teachers and, and so forth. We basically have no conversation these days about um, segregated and integrated schools, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I do think a federal government could, in fact, sort of symbolically change that. Also, frankly, uh, I mean, I think the reason that some large percentage of those who are going to vote for Trump next month will vote for Trump is because they're aware of the consequences for the Supreme Court. And right through, so federal judicial side of things also could have incredible consequences for education. And so if we end up with a far more left-leaning Supreme Court, in my dreams, they might overturn Milliken, which is saying that, um, that integration efforts have to stop at school district lines, right? And that, you know, in my dreams, you would actually have, say, uh, integration efforts with, say, within the, the whole state, or you might have all sorts of transfers, say, among among districts. That's another way in which the right. federal government could become yeah. very involved, yep. that it hasn't been in the last, say, 30 or 40 years as much. I, I think that, that that's really critical because segregation today is a lot different. Segregation today is, is de facto segregated. We, we have de facto segregated <laughs> schools because we've got large concentrations of poverty. Um, in, in largely Latino neighborhoods now, both in urban and, and rural areas. Um, and in inner-ring suburban. Uh, yeah, and also mm -hmm. in inner-ring suburban, of course, um, where now the, the, perhaps the biggest gap is now between Asian Americans and Latinos. Um, we have in our uh, kind of mindset and the self-image of being a black and white country uh, but, but now some of the largest cleave, cleavages of inequality um, are within immigrant groups. Mm -hmm. Well, Secretary King right now has been, yeah. in his tenure, yeah. has yeah. tried to put some emphasis on that, not mm -hmm. without generating a lot of pushback. Right. Uh, but well, to the contrary, and it does, it, it, go ahead, David. I was just going to say, one thing you did was create a program that, f that gave out money. This is the power of the right. person. Again, create a program that gave out money to districts that are trying to experiment with socioeconomic. Yeah. But again, in a competitive grant way, so yeah. not actually in a directive way, right. uh, which I think in areas where we actually have problems that we want to solve, but we don't know exactly how best to do it, it Maybe probably makes a lot more race. sense. And yeah. that's another example of an area where I'd love to hear more. Hillary Clinton, one of the things she has talked about related to the issue of school to prison pipeline is actually a $2 billion program uh, to address school discipline reform uh, with that as its goal. I want to hear again how something like that would be structured. Again, because of the window it would provide me into how she thinks about how the federal government and the president can most effectively drive change. Mm -hmm. Well, let, let's come to that uh, a little more directly then, because we're sort of talking around what the, the federal role ought to be or what it's likely to be after the Every Student Succeeds Act. And I know, Marty, you had a hand in, in, in writing that and participating in putting that together. And that pushes a lot of authority now back to the states um, to set direction in education policy. It's a reaction to a period that's viewed as uh, having been overly muscular in terms of federal involvement. Um, what do you see post ESSA being the role of um, the presidency and, and a presidential, uh, well, a, a president in education in light of what the Congress has done on education now? 
So uh, there's no doubt that ESSA shifts a lot of decision making specifically about the design of educational accountability systems back to the state level and it also places a lot of very explicit prohibitions on creative attempts to, I guess, look over the shoulders of states as they mm -hmm. make those decisions. Uh, and that is a reaction on the part of Congress to the perception that uh, the Obama administration had been pretty creative. Um, <laughs> and, and it's still being creative. It, and it's still, and they're still finding a way, which yeah. shows you it's not clear that this is going to be uh, successful. Um, but, you know, uh, I, would like to see, um, I guess, the return to a federal role where we focus on what the federal government does best, which is um, enforcing civil rights. It plays an essential role mm -hmm. there. Uh, redistributing resources across states, which is a role that only the federal government can play. It has a variety of programs, most notably Title I for disadvantaged students and special education for students with disabilities that ostensibly aim at, to do that but actually don't do a very good job of uh, actually falling through because of how they're designed. Um, providing information and transparency uh, and again that's where sort of the federal government has a role to play in making sure that the information that they're requiring to be disseminated with the Every Student Succeeds Act, that's one of the things Congress said to actually do, that it actually gets out in the way that uh, I think the federal government can ensure that it does. So that includes both information about student performance, but also on uh, spending levels that can provide pressure on states and districts to address equity concerns. And then also uh, research and development and innovation. Mm -hmm. uh, I think there's actually broad consensus uh, on both sides of the aisle that that is a legitimate, useful federal role. Um, so I, I mean, so I in carrying out those functions, what, what does that leave for the president? Is that the proverbial bully pulpit, or well, uh, what's left? I, I, well, I do think the president can be in, incredibly influential through the bully pulpit, but there, uh, I, I think the, there are questions about. So we accept that the federal role is uh, an important aspect of the federal role is enforcing civil rights. Well, how do you go about doing that? Um, mm -hmm. How aggressively do you use the office of civil rights? The Obama administration, again, has taken one approach to that that differed from some of their predecessors. Um, so I, I guess you're asking me to take a position on, uh, on what they, how they should uh, handle those types of things. But I, I guess I'm answering where their priorities should be. Yeah, no, fair enough. Because, right, I mean, what constitutes a civil rights violation is, I mean, to some extent there's a legal, uh, you yeah. know, uh, boundaries for that. But there's a lot of ambiguity, right? And so there's a huge questions of, say, when you have self-evident, sort of, uh, documented disparities in suspensions or expulsions of kids by color, right, at, you know, in preschools or in elementary schools, does that constitute a civil rights uh, violation mm -hmm. or not, right? Does that merit federal intervention? Does it mer merit federal intervention if you have uh, differences in rates of employment or retention of teachers of color? Or does it, right, I mean, uh, funding disparity, right? I mean, I think, exactly. you know, th that's a huge question. And, mm -hmm. and so you, we could all agree that that's a federal role. But it, there might be. And immense... therefore, part of the president's role to help in, in directing yes. decisions that are made in those areas. Exactly, which could go in many, many different ways, mm -hmm. right? Yes, yeah, so with very different measures. Are you going to take standardized test scores as your you know, measure by which you're trying to figure out civil rights uh, dispar you know, violations? Or are you going to take disciplinary measures? Are you going to take uh, you know, other kinds of outcome measures? Sorry, David, you were about to speak. No, no, I was just going to say, I mean, I think the reality. Um, to me, anyway, is that, is that the um, the president, you know, the president's role in education is going to be somewhat problem oriented. I mean, it's going to be a view of, you know, what are the biggest challenges that are right in front of us that we have to face, and the president's going to use the bully pulpit to try to address those head on and then provoke federal action. And I actually think that, I mean, I might be in the minority on this panel, but I actually think that the situation in K through 12 education is much better than you might think if you just read the news and hear people talk about it. Like, I know segregation is worse now than it was 25 years ago, and that's not a good thing. On the other hand, the black-white test score gap and the Hispanic-white test score gap are actually significantly smaller than they were in the early 1990s. Mm -hmm. Graduation rates for, for youth of color are up quite a bit in the last decade plus. We don't know exactly why that is, why those two trends go together, but the reality is things are not, you know, things are not cratering, as you might think. On the other hand, in higher education, not to return to this again, but in higher education, you've got what I think a lot of people think of as, a, as an increasing problem, which is that college is getting a lot more expensive. 
The side of it people talk about less is that you're, getting, you're not getting as much for your money. So it's one thing if, if the price of college goes up, but the quality increases as well, right? So like, you know, Harvard, the Harvard Graduate School of Education is a more expensive place to go to school than many other institutions you might choose, as many of you probably know. But hopefully you're getting some quality for your money. You're getting, you know, faculty and you're getting things like this. The issue that I think is going on with public higher education is that you're charging more for the same product. Okay, because of this, um, what's happened over time is that as states are investing less money in higher education directly through legislative appropriations, you know, they're just having to charge more to cover their costs. Because even though you think that tuition at, let's say, the University of California is you know, 25000 or 30000 a year, it's a lot of money, they're actually spending something like fifty or $60,000 a year to educate students. And the difference between what students are paying and what they're getting is made up by state money usually. And so when that state money goes down, you've got to charge more just to maintain things. And so I think what you see is, um, you know, prices are going up, that's the kind of political hot button issue, but just as troubling, at least from my perspective, is that spending is, spending net of price is, is going down. And so you're seeing basically I'm, charged, I'm spending more money, but I'm getting a more overcrowded classroom, I'm getting more non-tenure track adjunct faculty, people who are only there for a semester or two, you know, I'm not getting into the classes I want to get into. And for me, that's a real opportunity bottleneck right now in the US, almost more so than K through 12. So for me, that's what I would think the president would focus more on, because they need to. And actually, I mean, the Higher Education Act, so I think the fact that the Every Student Succeeds Act largely addressed the most pressing policy problems in K-12 education, if not the underlying substantive problems. Uh, the Higher Education Act is the next major bill that Congress yep. would turn its attention to and really is the window of opportunity for a president to have an imprint. Yeah, and we'll learn a lot about what these candidates stand for in their reaction to that as president. Mm -hmm. um, I want to turn the, the conversation just to a, a related topic, but one that doesn't get much discussed, which is the party platforms. Leading up to the convention every year, there's this drama about formulating a a party platform which reasonable people uh, disagree on whether or not it's impactful or irrelevant to uh, uh, the future activities of leaders within the party. But nonetheless, these party platforms represent the struggles that one finds within the parties over key issues and make for a very illuminating reading about what's, uh, what are the stresses <laughs> and strains within the families. And uh, so I wonder if, uh, if our panelists think that uh, we should be paying more attention to these platforms. What, if anything, you think the platforms tell us, and do you think they will guide action by the next president? So I, I don't think they are consequential at all. They're hardly binding, and, uh, uh, but so I don't think they're consequential, but I think nonetheless they're quite informative about exactly the issues you were just alluding to, the uh, sort of conversations, debates that are going on internally within parties, uh, and they provide a lens into the views of the most active members of each party, um, most activist members of each party, which are the people engaged in the platform committee work. So uh, what's especially interesting, I think, is to see changes from one election cycle to the next because they uh, generally start with the document from the last time around and make revisions. And so in the Democratic Party platform this year, you did see some significant changes to the language around test-based accountability, uh, especially its use for teacher evaluation purposes, um, and to the language around charter schools as well that I think are indicative of conversations that are happening within the Democratic Party nationally uh, in the states and uh, can be really revealing, uh, even if they are totally inconsequential for the president uh, as, the, you know, as a document itself. Did you notice comparable changes on the Republican side? So I actually haven't looked as closely uh, at the Republican side. Um, I read through it briefly and saw uh, congratulations to states that had left the Common Core, which right. I thought was a a nice way of finessing the issue that I uh, mentioned earlier. They could look backwards and congratulate them. Um, I saw references to you know continued support for school choice, um, uh, things on abstinence-only education, stuff you would expect, uh, I guess, activists to be interested in. But I didn't notice substantial changes that were eye-catching in any way. Okay. Others on uh, platforms, I know this, not everybody is reading or expected to have read them. <laughs> uh, I took a look at them myself for, for the first time today uh, and, uh, and found them revealing in the, in the sense that we were just talking about. I think it is revealing that um, 
many of us have not read the platforms, right? It, you know, despite being very, very interested in, um, mm -hmm. you know, federal uh, level education policy mm -hmm. or, or practice, right? I mean, I think in a way that's an answer to your right. question, right? So <laughs> all of you travel uh, around the country, you go to other states and, and uh, you observe and hear people campaigning for various offices. We've been talking about the presidential campaign, but really this is about the election as a whole. Um, what other signs of interest in education or voices on education do you hear when you're out and about? So I'm, th this isn't about the US. So I, I was in Mexico um, late last month. And I was um, fascinated by uh, how much the conversation in Mexico is about teacher evaluation, uh, teacher quality and teacher evaluation, and, um, and moves towards high stakes uh, testing as a means of engaging in teacher evaluation. And then actually, thanks to uh, Professor Howard Gardner, he invited me into a meeting with a um, group this morning, the Professional Honor Foundation uh, from the Netherlands that is, has been working at, fascinatingly, they, the part of professional honor is that the honor of the profession to uh, basically to define their own professionalism, right, R rather than having it be defined by others and uh, sort of bureaucratically or through, say, standardized tests. And, and I've been talking with people in England who have been, uh, one of the things that I'm struck by is, right, we're, we're aware that we live in a global world of education policy and education reform where there's a lot of idea transfer. Um, and I think that these fissures, that say we started out talking about, say within the Democratic Party and within the United States as a whole, are also fissures, right, that are, we're starting to see um, internationally and transnationally. And, and I do also then see them in uh, the states. So I was in California this past weekend for a conference on changing access to higher education. And we were having a lot of conversations about the uh, increasing spread between different kinds of um, Colleges, say, in the UC State system, and then we were sitting at Stanford, which is much, you know very nice and cushy, <laughs> right? And discussing, uh, and so I think issues of equity and issues of accountability and issues of how we create a profession in light of those two pressures, right? The pressure who to whom we should be accountable and how, in order to achieve more equitable outcomes for all. I think that's something that I hear in states, and I'm really fascinated about the different ways in which I'm hearing it internationally. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's something that we are wrestling with um, from our from our family, you know, sort of kitchen tables, mm -hmm. uh, all the way to the global system. I mentioned earlier the the what I think to be one of the kind of fundamental questions about of this election is really this question. Uh, Samuel Huntington posed several years ago the question of who are we? Um, and I think that a lot of people are grappling with this. I think that, as I mentioned earlier, Trump has used this as, um, as really a rallying cry for people who are, are, are afraid of, of what's happening demographically in this country. Um, in California, Californians have the opportunity um, this election cycle uh, to reverse uh, the end of, uh, of bilingual education. Uh, 18 years ago, mm -hmm. uh, California passed Proposition 227. Um, uh, Proposition 58 in California this year um, seeks to, um, uh, seeks to uh, put bilingual education back in Californian schools. California, if you consider, uh, more than uh, uh, 1.4 million uh, English learners are in California schools, uh, but there are probably about 400 dual language schools in, in all of California. Uh, this is a really critical issue. I think not only in California, but as California leads the way uh, nationally, I think that what happens in California, I think will, will certainly have a big effect uh, moving forward nationally. I think one, so I think there's a way in which the, the conversation around immigration 
has its roots in education because of the opportunity that education provides to the next generation. So I think if you look at, for example, let's take um, a male with a high school degree, no college degree, a uh, white male, and compare that person to an immigrant with, no, with a high school degree, no college education, a recent immigrant, you might say they have, let's say they have the same income and the same family structure and everything else. One salient, frequent difference between those two people is that the immigrant is more likely to have come from a family, from their own family where they came from worse circumstances. So they feel that they have an upward trajectory. On the other hand, even though they might be, they might face significant disadvantages, they might feel like they're doing better than the previous generation. It's a dual frame of reference, right? Yeah, whereas there might be a white, you know, white, many white men with college degrees living in many parts of the country feel like they're going to do worse than the next generation. And people like them in a previous generation had access to things like the GI Bill, which yeah. provided a college education for people who, who served in the military. It had things like the community college movement, which were locally controlled movements that provided funding for community colleges in communities that were not in urban centers. And we don't have anything like that now. And so you've got people looking at um, the prospects of, of a future that is not as good as the previous generation. And I think, mm -hmm. I think that's driving a lot of anti-immigrant sentiment, yep. n which is not to excuse it in any way, just to understand it. And I, so I think, to me, the core issue is really uh, you know, using education to provide hope and, and, and um, some prospect of upward mobility um, for a lot more people than currently have that. And I think, I think that would help a lot uh, with our current discourse, personally. I think that's right. Another way of framing the last question, it strikes me sort of in historical reference. Um, if I think back 25 years ago, shortly after the first President Bush had a, a um, summit on education in, in Charlottesville, Virginia, there was widespread agreement, sort of a consensus vision in governmental sectors, particularly governor's offices, and certain corporate and philanthropic uh, circles about what needed to be done in the world of education. You had a lot of people running on the platform of being an education governor, uh, people like uh, Governor Cl then Governor Bill Clinton, Governor Riley, Governor Hunt, uh, people really leading with that issue. I don't see that today. I don't hear a lot mm -hmm. of people leading with a vision about where we're headed in the future in education. When I hear controversies about education or platform issues that have to do with getting rid of the Common Core, scaling back testing, what we're gonna do about charter schools, but it's usually a reaction to something they don't like that's happening in the present. So I, it makes me wonder about whether or not this sort of, um, to, you know, to the point we were discussing earlier, Mir, about whether or not the space has just become too treacherous for leaders at any level to wanna to venture into at this point, given the state of our politics. Any well, comments on I'm that? I'm curious if you think this is right. Like, I, I'm thinking about the education governor, which you're right, was a huge thing. And then it really became an education mayor, right? Because uh, urban, uh, we had this huge t trend t toward mayor control, mayoral right. control over large urban yeah. districts. And then it turned out that mayor, even with mayoral control, right, it's really, really hard to get uh, urban education Right, and so, I, and I'm wondering if what we're seeing is that even as it went down into more local control, that became hard, and we may hear less even about actually being the education mayor anymore, because mayors have realized it's a little too dangerous to, exactly. right, to yeah. stake their political future on the success of the school district. Um, and now maybe it's a little hands off. So, I don't know. So what do you guys think? So if that's the case, where do we go for a vision? Well, I, don't know. Well, I do. I do know that there's. An, <laughs> I, I agree that there's a need for a new or revised sort of a vision for education reform, and and I don't have it at least in full. Uh, but I have <laughs> sort of a, a an optimistic thought, which is that. Um, about where sort of new ideas come from, which is that I don't think they come from the federal government and therefore not really from presidential leadership except uh, from the bully pulpit. So the last major reauthorization of ESEA to actually reduce rather than sort of expand federal regulation was in 1981 mm -hmm. under Reagan. And uh, that was followed with sort of a federal use of the bully pulpit with the Nation at Risk report. Yes, um, but there was uh, a wave of state activity uh, in response, perhaps, to having a bit more control that I think generated this set of ideas that culminated in the late 1980s in the meeting of governors, the effort to put together sort of a, a coalition to advance a common set of ideas. That led naturally to No Child Left Behind, which went off the rails a little bit, but I think, you know, um, may have overdone it, uh, but I think, um, <laughs> 
that's sort of the trajectory in which ideas about education generally uh, emerge in the United States is from the states, perhaps even from local levels up rather than top down. So I think we need to be looking to see what happens in the states now uh, going forward. Do you think the profession has an important role in that? I opened with some comments about that. We're so used to having reform done to us in the field rather than with us or by us. Part of that's because we're divided ourselves on what we think is important. Do you see an opportunity here or the possibility of any kind of coming together within the field to uh, shape that vision? Yeah, that's actually exactly where I was going to uh, chime in to say that in a way, I mean, what's interesting with that whole description, right, was that uh, that, that description, which I think was a basically accurate description, right? Thank you. Uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> was, um, uh, who am I to know? But, um, uh, but was, it, was a description of policy actors who are not educators, right? Um, and... Uh, and that's something we've been wrestling with mm -hmm. in education. Again, not only in the United States, but globally, but particularly in the United States. I mean, I think we have it, uh, we're more extreme than in some places, right, where there is a stronger tradition of uh, both teacher voice and, and educational authority through the sense of there being a profession. It, if we could get it together somehow, actually to, um, come together, for educators to come together, you know, early childhood educators or uh, high school educators who are interested in uh, the shift in, in higher education access or even music educators or something, but in a way that's not just sort of special pleading. So, you know, I, for a number of years I did work on civic education and the two things that I really strongly resisted were the civic education advocacy people are hitching our wagon to whatever seemed to be really popular at the moment. So like, civic education is 21st century skills, or <laughs> civic education is really literacy, right? Or, you know, whatever. Good for your math score. <laughs> right, exactly, <laughs> yes, yes. And I just thought that was terrible, <laughs> right? In part because, surprise, surprise, those things didn't last as long as they might have. But then the other thing that uh, we would do that I really strongly resisted was being the special pleader of, well, we need more time for civic education. I think that if nothing else, this election demonstrates that that is true, that we do need more civic education in this country. But I don't want to be fighting against the advocates for music education and physical yeah. education and other things, right? I think it has to be about shifting the vision of what we are about, what schools are about. And I do hope that that could come from the, within the profession itself so that in part it helps professionalize us. But I'm not sure that I have hope that that's going to happen anymore. Time soon. So, so I, I think that this raises a raises a, I think a really important distinction. There's there's a all these questions around control that I think are important, but also these questions around responsibility, right? And who's responsible for for educating our nation's kids? And I think that that your question um, um, really I think helps us to think about educators as. As, as part of the as part of the solution, as, as those those of us who have a stake in this and who are also responsible for uh, for educating um, our nation's kids. Speaking of questions, let me let me kind of close out this segment. I've asked you earlier what you how you'd script a candidate for presidency. Um, what you what you put on that list. I wonder if you had a moment after the election with the winner and could raise for that candidate a clarifying question that you'd like that candidate to ponder. For example, I might raise the question, um, what are you going to do about the strong correlation that still persists after all of our education reform efforts between poverty and educational achievement and attainment? But what, what kind of a clarifying question might you pose to the president to think about as they prepare to assume office in January? I can, I can start. Uh, okay, so, you know, sc schools are supposed to do many different things for our kids. All right, we, if, we, uh, if I did a poll and I said, what do you think are the five most important goals of schooling, you know, I'd get many different answers. One thing they definitely should do is, is prepare people for adulthood and the world of work. And so I think I would ask um, the president, the, next, the future president, um, what are you going to do about 
the fact that um, many schools, even pretty well functioning schools, have an educational model. It looks very, very industrial revolution, looks very 20th century, and doesn't look that much like what you do in the workplace. Um, there's a lot of direct instruction, kind of teacher to student, whereas in the workplace there's a lot of um, group, you know, working with colleagues, moving flexibly from one situation to the next, understanding things in context. How are you going to help redesign educational systems to look like that instead of look like what the world of work looked like 100 years ago? Great. Thank you. Marty? So I think I would ask, uh, picking up on Mira's observation that this election uh, does raise questions about the civic purpose of schools and the extent to which they've been uh, fulfilling it, uh, what will you do to reinvigorate the civic mission of American education in light of, yeah, <laughs> uh, in light of the importance of other goals, like preparing students for uh, the world of work, um, but also in light of the challenges that a president or any other federal actor has in uh, sort of uh, engaging in that uh, space. You know, challenges illustrated by the pushback to math and reading standards in the case of the Com uh, Common Core. Um, obviously, a set of standards for civic education probably is not the, uh, you know, the immediate next step. So. Right. That's what I'd ask. Well, I will say we have the C3 framework. That's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think thinking about the toxicity of, the, of this campaign um, and thinking about the demographic changes that I mentioned earlier, um, I, think, I think asking really what are, you, what, what are you doing to, or what will you do, what is the challenge to kind of embrace or to, to help people recognize and embrace these demographic changes uh, these inevitable demographic changes in communities and schools, and, and, and how will you work to address some of the complexities they pose? Great. Thank you. Mira? Um, I'm going to take the prerogative to ask two and a half questions. <laughs> One is, following <laughs> yeah. Marty, how do you think see the federal government as actually as being able to make positive change without having actually sort of predictable pathologies follow, right? Because um, uh, I'd be curious, and I think it's something that's really important for them to think about. Uh, I think the other question would be a very broad ground up question of what would you view as an outcome for our nation and our nation's kids that you would be, you could live with, right? What, what's your, what, what's your vision? Um, and then, how c can you conceive of mobilizing others, not in a state of crisis, but in a, in a, an orientation of, sort of pragmatic optimism, to get us there? Because so I think we've been so crisis-ridden and so reactive in the world of education and education reform over the last few decades, um, that if we could actually see ourselves working towards a, a positive vision that's realistic but also rightfully ambitious, and then think about how people could be mobilized rather than just controlled or staved off or, or whatever, I'd be really interested in their thinking through that. Great. Thank you. And thank you to all the panel for uh, what I thought was a great discussion to open up the evening. So we'd like to turn it over to you now. Oh, don't clap yet. Don't clap, right. <laughs> Half an hour of questions. Six questions. Yeah. We'd like to turn to you now, the members of our audience, to uh, raise questions. And we're going to take questions uh, from our uh, participants online as well as from those of you in the audience. Again, we really ask for questions. I know there are a lot of opinions about these issues, but out of respect to all of those who have questions, we'd ask you to uh, step to the microphone, identify yourself, and, and briefly raise a question for us. Hi, Paul. I'm asking okay. a question for the New York viewing uh, uh, audience. Their comment is great comments regarding division within parties regarding ed policy. Any prospects for realignment slash unity within parties in event of a blowout election? In uh, event of a blowout election. I guess I was the one who raised the issue and so I have to try and answer it. I, I mean, so I think when I, uh, so uh, 
the Republican Party is going to have a reckoning of some kind. Uh, that's for sure. <laughs> if it's a blowout, I'm assuming a Clinton blowout. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I have I've already admitted to my students in my class on the politics of education that I'm not a good enough political scientist to. Uh, fully understand what's going on in real time right now. Um, but I, I don't really see those, um, those rifts within the two parties uh, changing. Um, you have seen Republicans partnering with teachers unions on specific education issues, specifically involving uh, the federal role, but not in a way that I think has produced any sort of enduring Realignment of organizational interests. So, so I guess my answer is is no. Anybody else want to weigh in on that? No, right. <laughs> it's a tough it's a good one. question. Yeah. It is. Yeah, it's a really no, I, and I, I uh, just my two cents on that. I, I I agree with Marty. It's hard to see these basic divisions in ideology. For example, the difference within the uh, Democratic Party about choice and about charter schools disappearing just because it's a landslide victory. It would be hard to interpret the victory one way or another on that issue. Yeah. And people who have those positions are going to maintain the positions because the positions are based on interest in many instances. Yeah, in many ways, if we had had a different Republican candidate and there was a blowout in favor of that different Republican, then I think I could imagine a huge coalescence. Mm -hmm. But the Democrats are too divided, I think, for that to happen. Yes, sir. How's it going? My name is Jamarcus. Uh, so for the last 35 or so years, we've seen tuition outpace uh, inflation at public universities. And I was wondering, uh, like that's incredibly difficult for community college students, which make up about 40% of undergrads. Mm -hmm. What can you, what do you think it would take for uh, Hillary Clinton to start a, a, a pro-community college movement to have some type of federal insight or federal research or funding go to community college students to make sure that they can at least make it to four-year universities? It's a great question, Jamarcus. Thanks. Uh, it's uh, I'll take it. I guess since I was talking about colleges, uh, I think so. Um, I think when one talks about free college, we have to be very we have to be very clear about what we're talking about, because college isn't like you know breakfast cereal where it's the same. It's like college. It, it's not one product. It matters what's what you're getting for your money. And so my my worry with the free the political um, optics of the free college movement is that we take our eyes off the quality ball and keep it only on prices. Because um, the reality is, uh, if I told you you could you have a choice, you can go to a college where you have to pay more tuition, but you're going to get a much higher quality experience, or you're going to go to a college where you're, it's going to be free, but you're going to your classes are going to be overcrowded. You're not going to be able, you're not going to take remedial classes. You're not going to get any support. It's not. It's really the evidence suggests that the that the, the the latter is actually worse than the former. And so I think we all want colleges to be really high quality and inexpensive. Like we want both of those things. But I think we have to be careful that we, if, if the federal, my worry is that the federal government gives a mandate to states essentially, an unfunded mandate or a weekly funded mandate that says you need to make community college free, they're gonna do that by cutting spending so much that you're gonna go for free, nominally be enrolled and not be able to get any of the classes you want. Mm -hmm. And so I would say, like part of like the tweak I was talking about earlier is to, I think um, if you took, if you, if you, certainly if you increased investment of the federal government in higher education overall, that would help. But even if you took some of the Pell Grant money and you made it a subsidy like Title I, so like Title I for higher education where you gave it directly to schools, then that stops the bleeding on the spending side a little bit and it directly supports particular institutions you want to support, let's say community colleges that are in communities that serve a lot of disadvantaged students. And that's a kind of better way, to, to, to my mind, to make sure that students can get a high quality education for less money. So that's, that's kind of how I'm thinking about it. Um, I definitely agree it's a big problem, and, if, and for me, it would be one of the highest priorities for the next administration, in my opinion, is to solve this problem. Right. Thanks. Yeah. Okay, Delia. Hi, I'm Adelia, a student in the EPM program. Um, so this 2016 election cycle has unearthed a lot of things, <laughs> and amongst them is this discourse over whether or not America is great. Um, and if it isn't anymore, when was it great? Do you think that the American exceptionalism that's inherent in our K through 12 history curriculum is partly responsible for this? Um, and if it is, should it be changed and what political levers might be available to make that happen? I'll great, take this since great question. Go ahead, I wrote a book about that. Um, uh, so, uh, 
Yes, I think that the, the uh, curriculum in, in K-12 and higher ed, actually, um, uh, history and social studies classes is uh, certainly complicit in this idea that uh, the United States uh, was great, uh, is great, except for, say, these last year and a half, uh, and will be <laughs> even, you know, even greater and, you know, that America is best. Right? Is it the only thing? No, of course, right? I mean, we have a, a curriculum throughout the United States, right? N not just, not a formal curriculum. We have the formal curricula, but we also have the informal uh, curriculum of monuments and songs and, you know, all, all sorts of things, right, that also teach us uh, a, American exceptionalism. But yes, I think that we should change the curriculum in a way that is open to multiple narratives that recognize it as the original sin that was embedded in the Constitution, that recognize uh, of, say, the three-fifths uh, clause uh, and the fact that we incorporated slavery uh, into the founding of our nation that recognizes the, the prior and ongoing original sin of uh, Native American genocide. Like, there are all sorts of things that we should be teaching uh, in that, that would be a more honest uh, accounting and would actually enable uh, the citizens and residents of our country to engage more thoughtfully uh, and more intelligently and more productively with changing demographics and so forth. Now, what the political, politically, how are we going to get there? Um, I don't think that it is as... So the short answer is, eh, you know, it's gone. American exceptionalism has lasted for some centuries, and it's likely to last for some centuries uh, to go. More optimistically, I actually think that as we become a browner country, right, uh, you know, white the white children will no longer be a majority of kindergartners in the United States at some point, starting for, you know in the next few years, right? And so we are going to change uh, quite visibly demographically as a country, ideally. Our, our civic participation will also change. And with that, things that we teach and how we teach them will change. And, and I, the teaching population will change. We will not, we are still a very, very white K-12 teaching population. That will have to shift over time because you simply aren't going to have the population, et cetera. So that might change. But also I think that there is a way in which we, um, could realize a different kind of greatness in America, right? Because we have this alternative narrative of being a nation of immigrants. We have a narrative of uh, opportunity and the American dream. We have a narrative about being uh, committed to fundamental rights that we've enshrined in the Constitution. We talk about them as constitutional rights, but they're definitely related to human rights. We have a narrative about being a beacon of light unto the world and being an international leader. And those are narratives that I think could get us somewhere and we have stories throughout American history about collective solidaristic action towards justice and toward equi equity that I think we could draw on. So that's my sort of more optimistic thing. Sorry, you got me on a rant, and I will stop here. <laughs> well, I have a follow-up. With the, yeah. opt so the alternative optimistic, would you still be comfortable calling it American exceptionalism? That's I mean, I, I heard you saying some, that we have some exceptional characteristics. Just I said uh, we have we have narratives. But it's a narrative that's <laughs> honest about uh, that, about our uh, you know uh, flaws. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, yeah. I think. I think I certainly wouldn't mind calling it American exceptionalism, right, from a political standpoint, right? Because I do think we could have a narrative of American exceptionalism that embraces, that, you know, actually elevates the same, that's pluralistic, yeah, right? Yeah. And that elevates even the same values, but by, draw, but by drawing out different stories, right? That draws out the story, say, when you think about the Montgomery bo bus boycott, not of Martin Luther King, but of the literally over 100,000 uh, people who put their livelihoods on the line to walk to work for more than a year, right? That's the, it's the same event, and it's a different way of telling the story. I I think I'd be perfectly willing calling it an exceptionalist narrative. And I think in some ways, yes, the United States is an exceptional country. Yeah. So are many other countries. <laughs> Fair enough. Thank you. Please. Hi, my name is Miriam Greenberg. I direct a project here called the Strategic Data Project. And lots of our state departments of education partners are struggling or are addressing for the first time this new like little detail in ESSA around like the ability to use um, like Perkins metrics in the way that they like assessed or in state accountability systems. So the idea that workforce 
uh, outcomes would matter. And I'm curious to know, like, we've kept workforce as an issue in like the, lab the Department of Labor or as a labor issue, but I think we have this sort of unique opportunity now where there's like a lot of anxiety around white male like job <clears throat> prospects and this opportunity opened up by ESSA to think about that match. Like, where does workforce mm -hmm. education belong in the policy conversation and what levers can we pull going forward? Good, thank you for the question. That's a great question. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think, um, so when I think of workforce education, I typically think of something that is piecemeal and somewhat inadequate, so, th so things like trade adjustment assistance programs where we say we've got some workers who are displaced by, you know, the, the, the plant closes and we've got some program, like sort of ad hoc program in a community college that tries to fix that problem. I think one thing that economists have learned, uh, there have been many things economists have learned starting with the financial crisis about what we don't know. Um, and then th and th I think one of the things we've really discovered is that the impact of trade is different than what uh, the mathematical models predict. And maybe that's not a surprise to anybody but, but, a, but an economist. Uh, but I think, you know, it, typically what happens, the interesting thing is you say, well, you know, free trade is good for everybody because it brings prices down. And it's like two countries wouldn't trade with each other unless they were both better off. And so everyone's going to sort of win. And yeah, there's this kind of adjustment because there are going to be some winners and losers in individual countries because, you know, if you make the good less productive, like, you know, Basically, China's making toys much cheaper than the US, so like, that makes everybody in the US better off. It makes people in China definitely better off. Um, but, oh, you know, there's this problem with this. And the toy manufacturers in America, they have to adjust and find new jobs. But they will. They'll go find another. And we found out that's not true. Okay? That does not happen. Basically, what happens is when the plant closes in your town, you don't move away from the town. The, the kind of models say you should move to where work is, and people don't do that. And they go, either go on disability, or they, I don't know if you saw this study recently, it says like half of, um, Half of unemployed, uh, middle-aged, pr prime-age working men are on pain medication. Th things, like th things are really bad for people who lose their jobs, and they don't adjust. And this is a big, big problem. And so to me, I would say, let's take that opportunity to, to get much more serious about workforce adjustment. Um, and, and I think it has to be through education. I don't think you can just, I, I think the core issue with a lot of these programs is you train somebody to use the new machine that the company needs today, and then the technology changes, and then their skills are obsolete again. I think we need to think about it in a much more comprehensive way, mm -hmm. like possibly comprehensively retraining people, getting them possibly whole new degrees, not just a certificate program and something in particular. That's going to be much more expensive, but it's, inc it's incredibly important. I, I do think, from a, again, from a historical context, the, the principal arguments that brought people together, for people from the business community, mostly from gov governor's mansions in the early, late 80s and early 90s, to back a strategic program of education reform, which was as much as anything a response to the Nation at Risk report, was fundamentally an economic, a human capital argument. In other words, we will not be able to grow the economy of this country unless we raise the skills of American workers because routine jobs are going to be automated or go offshore and there will be nothing left in the middle of that economy at the lower end of that economy unless you have high skills and high knowledge. So that became the fundamental premise for the argument of paying attention to education, investing in education, and reforming education. Now we're at the tail end of 25 years of reform in this regard and the, the results are modest in terms of the level of improvement, better in some places than in others, but relatively speaking, modest. And I think it's time for that conversation to happen again. We've got a lot of good models uh, out there about school to work transitions and doing that more at the secondary level than we have been doing in high school reform, leaning in the direction of applied skills as a lens through which to develop more general academic skills. So I think there's a moment of opportunity in that field around which you could build a fair amount of consensus in both parties, I would think. Okay, thank you for your question. Yes, sir. Hi. I'm Aaron, studying education policy and management here at HGSC. And I was really glad to hear people bring up civic education because it just doesn't get brought up. I might be igniting another uh, rant. <laughs> um, but as a former history teacher, literacy teacher, it was like amazing to me how devalued social studies was and how civics was like an afterthought to the afterthought of social studies. So I have a pretty simple question with, I'm sure, a much more complicated answer, which is how do you create the political will to get people to value civic education as a real thing? 
I wonder if this is actually the time to do mm -hmm. that, right? Because people That's really nice. are, you know. Yeah. It, it, so in, in some ways, I, I have thought, you know, I, I, so I've been spending my time this semester concentrating on teaching the doctoral program that I'm teaching, uh, working on doing various sort of service projects here, here at the ed school, uh, thinking about our master's program and so forth. Part of me thinks maybe I should have just been giving those things short shrift and like writing op-eds and blog <laughs> posts and like trying to get mm. myself on TV and other things like saying, do you see what the consequences are, right, of having yeah. no civic, you know, no meaningful civic education for decades, right? You are living with this. We are living with this. Maybe you want to rethink, right? Now, I haven't done that, clearly. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, and, uh, well, it may not be so clear to my students, but I, I really, I mean, I have been working hard. Uh, but I do think that this might be the time. And hopefully people's memories aren't so short that we only have another three weeks, right? Ideally, people's, uh, sh people will be sufficiently shell-shocked for the next year or two, that this really is the time to try to develop a public mm -hmm. voice and, uh, <coughs> and make some changes. Uh. The only thing I'd say, as somebody uh, who's had policymaking authority, um, to echo what Marty said earlier about you know, the focus on civics, maybe the best place to start isn't with a set of standards and accountability mechanisms. Because at the top level, um, when you get into policy circles, there gets to be a great deal of disagreement about how this ought to be approached. Mm -hmm. So I, I see this as a, you know, a fertile opportunity for a kind of bottoms up uh, approach to how we do this. I, I see our current crisis you know, as, as partly a function of how poorly we've done on, on civic education and partly a function of the economic realities yeah. that Dave was just talking about. That our failure to respond yeah. to that early 90s challenge of of uh, upping our investment in human capital and preparing people for 21st century high skill, high knowledge jobs has resulted in a lot of people uh, losing jobs, losing hope, losing opportunity, and then losing ultimately faith in our country. And that's part of what we're seeing in this campaign cycle. I, I'd have one suggestion, strategic suggestion. We could get the elite colleges of our country to start caring a lot more than they currently do about students who engage in serious civic civic programs of study, who engage in politics, who engage in, rather than just thinking about SAT scores. Because if, if you do that, hmm. and if people think that, that, I mean, I know that's not, that's not a principled way to go yeah. about it, necessarily, <laughs> but it'll make people listen. Hmm. If I think that you know, getting into an elite college is about participating in civic life, hmm. then I think that would be a good way to start. Hmm. Very similar in spirit to that comment, I think. You know, we've, one of the reasons why you experience as a teacher social studies being devalued is that we've had been working under a accountability regimes that were quite unrealistic in terms of their expectations and focused yeah. narrowly on math and reading. Mm -hmm. I think hopefully under this new federal law we have the opportunity to implement regimes that even if they still focus on math and reading primarily do so in a way that's much more uh, nuanced and less likely to crowd out everything else. So that's why I think there are opportunities. And I, I think it's a mix of leadership, potentially, even from a, pre, a president to call attention to the issue. But it's got to ultimately be bottom up, like mm -hmm. Paul was saying. I, I will think, also, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, I, 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 very, very quickly, I think also tied to this conversation is this is the issue of ethnic studies. Mm -hmm. um, and that is, going back to an earlier question or, or, or comment, um, is, is allowing students to feel like they're part of the curriculum. Uh, that, that for many many students, for many students to, across the country, entering into the public school system means leaving behind their family's history, their community's history, their culture, and so allowing students to feel like their their story is centrally part of mm -hmm. of, of, of the of, of, of civics education, of, of history, um, of their curriculum. And I will add, so there is, I was one of the civics writers for this uh, C3 frameworks, the college career and civic life frameworks for state social studies standards in uh, history, geography, civics, and economics. Um, and, and in fact, 
states are now doing social studies curricula uh, revisions using the C3 frameworks. The Massachusetts has right now launched a revision of its own social studies, history and social studies curricula. Um, and so if you're interested, you should get involved. They're doing stuff on it right now. Um, California, Kentucky, New York, uh, Illinois, other states have also been working on that. And so I think it's important also to think about the number of different places that you can get involved. One of the things about the C3 mm -hmm. frameworks was that one of the reasons I agreed to be one of the writers for it is that the last attempt to create even something that was voluntary national consensus blew up um, in the uh, mid 90s, 90s, right? And there was, end up being a 99 to one Senate, US Senate vote condemning the standards before they had been released. And so nothing happened for 25 years. And I figured when I was invited to join the writing team for the C3 frameworks that it was most likely also going to be a total failure. And if it was, then nothing would happen for 25 years. And if it miraculously turned out to be a success, then really nothing would ha else would happen for 25 years because nobody would want to touch it. And miraculously, it's actually, I think it's a pretty good set of frameworks, right? It's very, it's totally, it has no content. I mean, that was yeah. one of the, right? <laughs> that's the problem, right? But that's one reason it's not a curriculum, it's not standards, right? It describes itself yeah. as a framework. As a framework specifically with regards to civics, I will say, I think it's pretty good. Uh, so <laughs> so okay. it, that can be a tool. Good. Thank you. Hi, I'm Johnny, uh, graduate of Harvard School. Um, I was curious, a lot of the pol politics and policy decision making, um, they, they come from politicians, but they also come from parents. Like, politicians are also parents, and they decide where to send their kids. I was curious how much the panel thought where these politicians actually send their own kids to school it makes a difference in the policies that they advocate for if they have a personal investment. Because not since perhaps Jimmy Carter has a uh, president actually sent a kid to public school. I, well, I, go ahead. Well, I, I, I will only say I've had direct experience with this as a public official being. Uh, either praised or criticized, depending on where, where one sends one's children to school. Three of my four children went all the way through public schools. One of my children, at one point, I put into a private school for a period of time. Um, when I did that and I was serving on a state board of education, I came in, I came under severe fire as soon as I crossed a major group. Um, for having chosen a private school for my child. So it's definitely a political topic um, that, uh, or, or a political point of vulnerability that, uh, that leaders have to endure when they're in office. To your point, um, does our own experience uh, as policymakers affect our, with our own children, affect our perspective on uh, what we think is important or valuable in education? I'd have to say it's my experience with policymakers that that is the case. That, that you are influenced in that way. Um, and at the same time, I think it's almost inevitable, uh, for example, in state capitals, uh, in the federal government, that uh, the experiences of people who come into policy positions, for better or worse, are often quite different than the experience of the average person in the street by virtue of their background or what it takes to get elected. Uh, so those are the leaders that we have and part of the role of the field and advocacy groups is to do a better job of educating policymakers about what more typical people's experience is like. One of my favorite um, social science studies is about um, how having daughters affects <coughs> legislators' policy preferences. It's very clear that when, when um, people in elected office have a girl, they support more female-friendly policies, work-life stuff, discriminate. It's very, it was very clear. So I, I think 100% who you are and your own experiences affect your, your policy priorities. Let's, let's capture the um, last two questions, and then um, and we'll close down. Um, before I say who I am, uh, my question is about the correlation between poverty and success in education in the United States. My name is Paula Woodard, and I'm all the way from Bakersfield, California, which is the Central Valley. I'm a recently retired teacher. I taught at a school where half of the students in my first grade class did not go to kindergarten because there wasn't a place for them. All of them spoke Spanish as their primary language. There were Mexican, 
and Filipino, and then I moved into Bakersfield schools where 90% of my students were white. Both the schools that I taught at had 90% free and reduced mm -hmm. lunches. So it's not just race, it's race and class in our country, but mostly it's poverty. And I could teach students if they came, but when they don't have any place to live, and they're living in cars and people's homes that are not their relatives. And then they come to school and they can't concentrate. And their mothers, if they have a mother and a father at home, have mental health issues and drug issues. I could help them, and I made a difference in my life as a teacher. But my name is not Jesus Christ, and I can't walk on water. And so we need help as teachers. We need somebody. We need counselors. We need Let's mental health. That's what I'd like to question. see, mental health and drug health and food to these people through the schools, and then people will support Thank the you. schools. Thank you for the question. Let's give the panelists a chance to respond to that. I didn't hear a question. Well, uh, I think the, so the opening correlation. question was what about the correlation oh, between poverty between, yeah, and success? Yeah. And yeah. So, uh, so I think this is, a, this is a really deep question, right? And I think that your, your, your question really points to the the importance or the, or the need for wraparound services, yes. right? Is that, that, that schooling is, is, is not enough when you've got populations that are dealing with housing insecurity, uh, with uh, parents who are working sometimes second and third shifts, and so kids don't spend a lot of quality time with their parents, uh, ongoing stress. Um, so um, I think that I would just say that I, you know, I. There's, there's only so much that, that, that teachers can do in a classroom uh, and that schools can do, but I think that, that part, of the, part of the function of, I think, community schools is to really kind of identify a range of needs for our kids um, and identify those wraparound services, uh, whether the school provides or, or through referral, because it, it's critical. You, I mean, we deal with the lives of, of kids as educators, but they've got so many more needs. I think I would also add that um, I think one of the things that has really divided the Democratic Party and divided our nation more broadly over the last 20, 25 years in education policy is this question of do you deal with poverty first mm -hmm. and then the educational benefits yeah. right fall out or do you deal with education and then, you know, yeah. then the economic benefits will fall out and clearly the, I, I mean, I, I hope this is where there is a rising consensus that we need some kind of both and approach, right? Um, and that we need to address the challenges and consequences of lived poverty right now, you know, this minute. In, uh, and we need to think about how we can create educational resources and opportunities where education is broadly understood to mean all of the things that children and families need to learn and to thrive, which is not, which may start with a good teacher in a safe classroom, but does not end with a good teacher in a safe classroom. Uh, and so, how how we how we concentrate on sort of do the, do the both end in a way that doesn't leave us just fighting for scarce dollars. We're we're almost out of time. I, I'll only add from my own perspective in the education redesign lab. The departing premise of our work is that uh, if we've proven nothing else over the past 25 years, we've proven that schools alone by themselves are an insufficient intervention on average to overcome the disadvantages of poverty. So as we look to the future, the vision has got to include some of the topics that you've correctly raised for us. So thank you for your thank question. You. Thank you can, for your service. Can, can I just jump, can I just yeah. say one? So I think, you know, school, so, um, there's no question that schools can't do it by themselves, that teachers can't do it by themselves. But I think that's the wrong question. I think the right question is not did we, did we close the achievement gap or did we lift people completely out of poverty through our own actions. The question is did we make their lives better? And I think the answer is unequivocally yes. Schools are the main engine of economic opportunity in this country, not just for the, you know, especially for the next generation. So every minute you spend with a child who needs help is doing more for them than almost anything else we can do with any other social program. That's the one thing we know from decades of social science research is that schools are the main engine of economic opportunity for the next generation. So just because we don't close the gaps doesn't mean we're not doing good work, that you're not doing good work. Thank you. Fair enough. Mm -hmm. Next point. Okay. 
Jody, did you have a final question? We're going to. No, we're, we're out of time. We're out of time. Yes, question pretty much answered it. Okay, very good. Okay, I want to first um, ask you to join me in thanking our panelists for a terrific discussion. <laughs> Thank, thank all of you for joining us. Uh, good luck in this election season, and uh, we'll see what happens. Maybe the debate tonight will resolve the whole thing. Yeah, that's right. <laughs>